April 23rd, 2013. Cracks had started showing in the walls of a building in Bangladesh called the Rana Plaza. The Rana Plaza was home to shops, a bank, and clothing sweatshops. The whole building had been ordered to evacuate and not return to work until the repairs could be done. But the sweatshops didn't have time for that. Instead, they threatened workers. They told them they would withhold a month's pay if they didn't return to work the next day. Most of these workers were women and kids who desperately needed the money. They couldn't afford losing a month's salary. So on April 24th, 3,122 people returned to work in the building. A lot of the clothes being made by these workers would end up in Walmart and Primark. The sweatshop owners knew the risk, but they forced the workers to go anyways. And just a few hours after the sewing machine started up, catastrophe hits. At 9 a.m. on April 24, 2013, Rana Plaza collapses. An eight-story building collapsed today, killing at least 145 people. During morning rush hour, it simply collapsed. It's estimated that more than 3,000 people, mainly female garment workers, were inside when the building came down. The sound of crushed concrete and falling walls could be heard all throughout the city. People who felt the collapse said it felt like an earthquake. After the collapse, the search for survivors and victims took almost three weeks. In the end, over 2,000 people were injured and 1,134 died. It was one of the most preventable accidents of its kind in history, but it was definitely not the only one. These sorts of catastrophes happen regularly in sweatshops. There's reports of managers locking doors to stop workers from getting out. And even when building owners know conditions are dangerous, they still force their workers to show up. And all of this is fueled by something called fast fashion. So you're a fast fashion brand like Zara, H&M, and Forever 21, and you make your money by selling something that's always in demand, cheap, trendy clothes. A famous TikToker posts a viral video wearing a bucket hat, and two weeks later, your shelves are stocked with bucket hats of every color. Two weeks later, the bucket hats are gone, replaced with whatever she wore on her trip to Hawaii. Unlike slow fashion from decades ago, people aren't buying high quality clothes to wear for years at a time anymore. They're buying low quality pieces that are made to be worn just a few times, then thrown out. So now the name of the game is making clothes as quickly and cheaply as possible to capitalize on these trends. So that every time customers walk into your store, they're bombarded with low prices, sales, and discounts on clothes that are in now, but will be out of fashion tomorrow. Today, the average piece of clothing in America is worn just seven times before it gets thrown out. And one out of every 10 piece of clothing in fast fashion stores don't even get bought. They just end up in landfills. And the only way these insanely low prices are possible are with sweatshops, of course, with some of the worst working conditions in the world. And here's how you can do it yourself. Just like how new fashion trends can be spotted weeks before they actually hit the stores, business and investment trends can be spotted long before they pop off. And if you're able to catch on to these trends early, you can make a lot of money. But this used to be a very tricky process. That is, until trends came along. With trends, finding the next big thing is ridiculously easy. Here's how it works. Trends' team of expert business analysts vet thousands of business ideas and sends the best ones straight to your inbox every week, long before they pop off. Not only is it a great resource if you're looking to start a new business, but it will save you months of research, testing, and the feeling of regret that you didn't start sooner. And that's not all. Trends also gives you access to an ambitious community of over 15,000 people where you could find your next co-founder or investor. Like this example where Trends uncovers signals that the indoor plant business was set to boom. One member took that report and launched a D2C plant startup. Now Rack received some valuable advice from the Trends community and then started building. 40 days later, he raised $1.5 million in funding. Or Craig who ran a brand called Nerdy Nuts. When he joined Trends, he asked for honest feedback and got roasted. Members repositioned his brand and had him focus on D2C. The result? He went from netting $60,000 to $1 million in revenue just a year later. So if you want access to these vetted business ideas and the community to make it happen, go to trends.co slash jaketran with the link below to get a 7-day trial of Trends for just $1. That's trends.co slash jaketran with the link below. Thanks to Trends for sponsoring this video.
So let's say you're planning on filling your store with the latest, trendiest cotton shirts. From sourcing material to sewing on labels, you need to make sure the people involved are working as fast and for as little money as possible. Here's the step-by-step -step guide to making as much profit in as little time as possible. Step number one, copy the design of the most popular cotton shirt you can find at the moment. Don't waste time or money on designers. Just rip off another design, change it up a bit, and boom, you are now a fashion designer. It's the reason why the clothes in every fast fashion store look almost exactly the same. Step number two, sourcing your materials. Now this is where things start to get fun. You see, you could buy responsibly sourced cotton from a reputable farm, but that's just so expensive. These farms are paying their employees a living wage, giving them time off, benefits, insurance, and you're the one that's expected to pay for it by buying their cotton? No thanks. Instead, source your cotton from a country like Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan, the government owns most of the land, and farmers have to lease it in order to plant crops like cotton. But because the government owns all the land, they've created a monopoly where each cotton farmer has to meet insane cotton production quotas and sell their cotton at a specified low price or risk being left without any sort of work or income at all. In most cases, the price set by the government is even lower than the production costs. Their solution? Slave labor. Every harvest, thousands of civilians, including doctors, teachers, and children, are forced to work on cotton farms to help reach production goals. These workers aren't paid, they have to live in camps or buildings without running water. And if they refuse to work, they may find themselves publicly humiliated, punished, or fired from their regular jobs. And even though most major fashion brands have signed agreements to not buy from Uzbekistan, companies like Forever 21 and Urban Outfitters still sometimes get caught using the country's cotton. If you don't want to go with Uzbekistan, maybe source your cotton from Xinjiang. Xinjiang is the westernmost region of China. It's known for its energy reserves, its giant cotton industry, producing one-fifth of the world's cotton supply, and its concentration camps for Uyghurs. After these camps were set up, these same prisoners were brought onto cotton farms and factories to be used as forced labor. What well, all of this means is that you get some very cheap cotton. But beware, since Xinjiang's camps are in the mainstream now, any association with them can lead to your brand getting boycotted or cancelled. But since it supplies one-fifth of the world's cotton supply, and that China is so opaque, you have some plausible deniability. The supply chain is so complex, I didn't know we were using slave labor. With such low prices for cotton, harvested using slave labor and sold for dirt cheap, you're ready for the next step in production, making the actual clothes. Step number three, the sweatshop. Once you've bought enough cotton for your trending cotton shirts, it's time to turn the raw cotton into the shirts. And this is where it gets interesting, because you may have a factory in a country like Bangladesh or India, but that is not where the real work gets done. You see, turning raw cotton into cotton clothes is a labor-intensive process, which makes it very expensive. So instead of directly employing people to get the job done, you outsource your production to local sweatshops. This again gives you a little plausible deniability in case anyone ever finds out the working conditions your clothes are made in. You never knew things were that bad, you were just outsourcing the jobs to benefit the country's economy. So you send the raw cotton to sweatshops, where managers agree to create clothing for dirt cheap at turnaround times that no one in America could ever dream of. These people are producing up to 20 shirts an hour, while being paid as little as 3 cents a piece. That is 60 cents an hour. Then you take that same shirt and sell it for $25 in your store. And the people who produce the clothes, they're mostly women and children who work over 12 hours a day. 170 million children are spending their days working in some of the worst conditions on the planet. They're verbally abused, not allowed to take breaks, forced to work even when they're tired, sick, or injured, all that for maybe 2 to $3 a day if they're lucky. And when people start feeling guilty for buying clothes made in Bangladesh, or India, or China, well, you hit them with the best trick in the book. A nice old reassuring made in the USA label. Whenever someone buys clothes that are made in the USA, they assume it's ethically sourced and manufactured. I mean, there are strict laws in place regulating the clothing industry, and if you're buying something made in America, you can do it with a clear conscience, right? Well, that's what you want them to think. You see, the truth is, there are lots of loopholes when it comes to using a made in the USA label. One great loophole to exploit is manufacturing your clothes on the Pacific island of Saipan, which is technically a U.S. territory. Even though it's part of the U.S., Saipan has its own immigration laws and industrial regulations. Every year, thousands of people arrive on the island promising that they'll be able to get jobs in America if they follow a complex immigration process. But the reality is, once they arrive, they have to pay off up to $7,000 in fees. 
most of these people don't have anywhere near that amount. So they work in sweatshops in Saipan, producing clothes that will eventually have a Made in the USA label sewn onto it. And boom, your customers have a clear conscience, and you get to keep your margins. Even in mainland America's strictly regulated clothing industry, sweatshops still manage to fly under the radar, even in places like Los Angeles, where millions of illegal immigrants work to produce clothing for cheaper than any legal factory. And when they're being abused or forced to work, well, they can't go anywhere because they could get deported. Now that you have your sweatshop up and running, it's time to hook in customers. People naturally want to be like their idols, so get the biggest influencers on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook to agree to do brand deals with you. Send them tons of stuff for free for them to promote. Have them create videos with titles like $400 shopping haul. Constantly instill the idea that clothing is disposable, that cheap is good. If their favorite TikToker is wearing your clothes, you must be a good company to buy from. Make them believe that they can throw their clothes out with every new fashion trend, or better yet, that they can just donate their old stuff to be a good person. If only they knew that 90% of donated clothes end up in landfills too. Make people believe that consumerism is benefiting society, that your supply chain is creating jobs, and making it easier for Americans to buy trendy clothes. The more people care about looking trendy and fashionable, the less likely they'll care about things like what's right. Once you achieve that, you're on your way to limitless riches. So let's say you followed every step in this guide to the T, but like many other brands before you, you find yourself caught in a sweatshop scandal. The best way to maintain your reputation, keep your customers' conscience clean, and keep the money flowing into your coffers is to pretend that you care. Immediately fire the sweatshop and factory responsible for the scandal, and then send out your spokespeople to tell everyone how shocked and horrified you are. Donate to a charity that helps out these workers, and maybe even appear on TV yourself looking distraught. Announce that you are committed to change. Show the world how you fired the factory responsible for the scandal. Tell everyone you're going to be sending inspectors to every single factory to make sure work conditions are up to code, and stick to your word. Fire the scandalized factory, but hire another one immediately after. This is even your chance to shop around and find a cheaper sweatshop than before. And all those inspectors you're sending out, they're just for show. You know that factory managers regularly force their workers to lie to inspectors, so as long as they're telling them what they want to hear, it will be business as usual. You can even slap on labels that say sustainable cotton onto your clothes. That way, consumers are less likely to ask questions and more likely to spend their salaries on clothes that they're only going to wear a handful of times. Do I buy clothes from these fast fashion brands? Yes, but I actually have very little clothes and the clothes I do have, I keep for a really long time. I wanted to bring this up because I'm definitely not a saint myself and I don't like pretending that I am. It's been a while since I've been on camera because it's been super, super busy. But yeah, if you're new here, this is the number one channel for documentaries on money, power, and crime. So subscribe and if you want documentaries that are too controversial to post publicly, you can click that join button below and you will get instant access to business documentaries going over things that they would never teach you in business school. We have one on Monsanto, MK Ultra, and the next one coming out very soon is on everyone's favorite private island owner, Efri Jepstein. So click that join button below. It's way cheaper than any like education you'll ever get. And there's a refund policy too. If you don't like it, email me and I will personally refund you the money. That's going to wrap it up. Stay dangerous out there and I will see you guys in the next one.